Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining and welcome back to Wall Street Silver. Joining us today is my good friend, Gary Wagner, the editor of goldforecast.com. Welcome back, Gary. Thank you so much for having me. It's good to speak with you again, Ivan. Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure having you back on, Gary. So a lot of people are talking about uh, precious metals. They're having their eye on precious metals lately. And with all this talk about economic uncertainty, let's start with gold first, and then we'll move on into silver a little bit sure. later. Uh, where are you at with gold for this year so far, and where is it heading? Well, we've got to put that into perspective in terms of looking at what preceded the current move that we're in. And that is after hitting... $10 shy of the all-time record, 2078, which came in in March of last year. We went into a long uh, multi-month correction. And then around November of last year, we started to bottom out at around 1600. And actually, I've marked it as a triple bottom. There were three places to break it to 1600 or below it held each time. Mm -hmm. November the 3rd is the day I marked as the beginning of the rally in gold. By the way, silver started a little bit earlier than that. It moved from 1620 to 1974. That's a tremendous move upwards. In other words, I've been doing this 35 years. To me, a strong rally in gold is anywhere between 150 to a $250 move to the upside. Mm -hmm. And we saw something that was close to 400. So obviously we entered a correction when it hit the high uh, 1974 about a month ago and started coming down. I think we are right now, we are in what I call a counter wave. In other words, we had that long correction down we're spiking up, and I'm looking at it through the eyes of an Elliott Wave technician mm -hmm. that sees the correction as a A, B, which we're currently in, and a final C correction. That's for, for gold and silver bulls like myself and yourself. That's the hardship we're facing. The good news is, is once that correction ends, if there's any merit to this technique, and I, I have proved time and time again to myself, that it's incredibly or can be incredibly insightful, then we've got that last push or rally mode, which will take us to whatever highs we see this year. Uh, so, Gary, what do you say to people uh, that say gold doesn't do anything and it's not a hedge to inflation? Uh, a few billionaires tend to say that don't invest in gold. Why, why do they say that? Well, the reason they say that is obvious. Um, gold doesn't yield any interest. It's not a stock that can go up or down based on performance. But for those that say it is not a hedge against inflation, I have to have a slight disagreement with that adage because gold is an excellent hedge against inflation, but it lags tremendously. In other words, if inflation ticks up, you're not going to see gold tick up in terms of a direct correlation in a short time frame. Mm. And the example I've used time and time again is a very, very long term look. You go back to the 1900s. If you had a gold currency, a dollar bill, they were a gold certificate, or you had a $20 gold piece. In 1910, this is when I, I look back to, you could spend a week in New York, have a good room at the plaza, buy a brand new suit, a steak dinner and go to the theater for that $20 gold piece or a $20 bill. Now, wow. <laughs> take us to current uh, current pricing, so to speak. Even with inflation, gold is sitting at roughly $1,800. For $1,800, you can still get a decent suit. Mm -hmm. You can get a room, although a little bit smaller at the plaza. You can have a steak dinner, but that $20 bill is not going to cover the Uber fare to your first part of the event. <laughs> So when you look at it in a large scale, in terms of buying power, gold has the same buying power now that it did 200 years ago. So to say that it's not a hedge against inflation is a misnomer. Mm -hmm. It's just that it doesn't tick up in the same way inflation does. It might take a year or so to catch up, but it always has maintained a pretty steady uh, buying power, what you could get for an ounce of gold hasn't changed that much in 100 or 200 years. But because currencies are fiat, that has changed tremendously. Mm -hmm. And 
Lastly, mm -hmm. on that note, when you look at what they're doing worldwide, which is, of course, we went through tremendously hard times in 2019 and 20, then into a recession. The problem that happened is countries turned the printing press on 24 hours a day, seven days a week to try to either work with people that needed money and send out checks or the Federal Reserve doing what they did, which is to swell the balance sheet that they have to an enormous amount. It's over eight trillion. Mm -hmm. Our national debt's at 31 trillion. So by virtue, the dollar as well as other currencies have nowhere to go longer term, but down. Intraday or week to week is noise. But as long as you print more money and, and flood the supply, the buying power of that dollar, that yen, that pound, that sterling has to go down. Mm -hmm. And that's why I've always been such an advocate of the precious metals, because over time they have proved to be resilient. And the resiliency is buying power. What can you get for an ounce of silver? Well, you can't get what you got when it was at $50, but it's still holding up a lot better than a U.S. dollar that is just a piece of paper that's backed by your faith in the government. Yeah, well said, Gary. Now, I'm going to share some uh, charts that you sent me a little earlier about the silver short-term forecast. So this is the short-term forecast. What are you seeing here right now? Well, the short-term forecast is looking at the potential um, of support at around $1,950. However, um, I really think we're at a critical area, as we'll see in the short-term forecast, because not only does it line up with a 50% Fibonacci retracement, mm -hmm. and as I said pre-interview, I'm using a really long data set, $11 to $30. A 50% takes us right to about 21 or 2098, which is exactly where silver is today. That's also the 200-day moving average. And of course, that is something that historically market technicians have used to determine whether or not uh, a commodity or a stock is in a long-term bullish or bearish, 100 day is interim, 50 day is short term. So it's the critical nature of where we're at. The, the short term forecast shows that we could see more downside pressure. Mm -hmm. However, I'm hesitant to jump on that bandwagon because as we spoke about, these technical indicators tend to be lagging indicators. Elliott Wave does forward projection candlesticks and Fibonacci are all also forward indicators, which is why they are my go to three indicators that I use for forecasting. But when you look at something like a moving average, it's an average over 200 days, it shows you where the market has been, mm -hmm. and compares it to where it is rather than forward thinking where it could go. Now that we've seen your uh, short term silver forecasts, We'll move into your medium term. I know that you sent okay. me that one too. So this is your medium term forecast. What are you seeing here? Like, is that what you said earlier? You'll see might a little bit of a pullback and then yeah, it it's back got up. a little bit of pullback, but it's showing that it could find potential support in this area. And the upside target short term is about $28. Uh, when we look at the long term, you'll see it moves up a little bit from there. Right. Um, interim term, what I'm doing is I'm using different time cycles in my charts, daily, weekly, and a two-week candlestick. And so that's what changes the, the timeline for the forecast itself. Now, uh, well, last but not least, let's share the long-term uh, forecast. What, what are you seeing now in the long-term forecast? You're going to well, see a bump I, up? Yeah, what I like about the long-term forecast is you can see that the lows that came in the body of the candle came just to the 68, 61.8% Fib retracement, the tails or wicks, which is the differential between an open and a close and the low of the day. Mm -hmm. um, those held that price point. We're right now again at that 50% level, and that's a respectable correction. It's already dipped below that and come up. I am looking at this as kind of a a line in the sand in the same way that I'm looking at 1800. These are necessary price points that both gold and silver need to hold uh, for us to say that we could form a base and could move higher from here. 
Now, Gary, 2022 was a record year for uh, silver demand, according to the Silver Institute, and global silver demand hit almost 1.21. I think it was 1.21 billion ounces. Uh, I think it's an estimate so far. I think later right, on right. in the year, the data comes out. Uh, where will the silver come from in the future as demand continues to grow? What's your opinion there, Gary? In, in terms of the output of the mines or the sources itself? I think like the output and the investors, like let's say we get to 2030 and the and there's so much silver demand, who gets the silver first, right? Well, that's an interesting question. <laughs> and it, it takes you back to basic economics of supply and demand. My sense, very long term for silver, is demand will continue to grow and at some point outstrip the ability of the mines to produce it. There have been people out there uh, for the last couple of years saying silver is going to go to 50 or 100 or 200 in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. I believe that's a little bit over optimistic. It's hard to put a exact timeline on it. But the reason I buy physical silver, which I do, and I happen to like the kilo bars because they're just inexpensive. <laughs> you can pick them up every month. And, you know, I, I look at the images on, on your Reddit site and I can see these huge accumulations of, of silver. <laughs> Long term, at some point, the demand will continue to grow in terms of the industrial sector, especially with green energy, mm -hmm. electronics. And those are two items where they're going to continue to need more silver. I'm not an expert in terms of production of the mines. I do know that I, I believe I read one article that said demand is increased by 16%, mm -hmm. uh, which is, I believe what you're citing, but the key is this demand, just as I said, the dollar can do nothing but go down in a long-term basis. In other words, month to month, week to week, it can do anything. And it's sensitive to interest rates and inflation, which is, what the Fed is trying to tackle. But long term, inevitably, there's only one certainty. And that is demand will outstrip the ability to produce it on a basis to fulfill that demand. Unlike gold, silver is not recycled as much. Right. A lot of the gold that we see uh, in terms of inventory is coming from a recycled nature. I mean, they've recycled it through jewelry and scrap gold and all of that for millennials. Silver tends to kind of stay in its form. If you've got, you know, uh, a silversmith that's making a beautiful tea set, that thing typically doesn't get melted down. The other thing, silver is a little bit harder to work with. If you look back to the Egyptians who actually did view silver as a more precious metal than gold, by the way. Yeah, I've heard about that. I've heard that's about that. correct. And, the, one of the reasons was you would see the gold mask like on, on some of the uh, pharaohs that got buried is because it was more pliable and easier to work with. Mm -hmm. Silver is much harder and it's much tougher to mold or to work with to create an art object or a religious artifact or something like that. And the Egyptians held silver in, regard, in terms of its intrinsic worth to be at the top level of precious metals. Um, obviously that has changed through the years, but think about palladium. When I started trading in the eighties, nineties, you could buy an ounce of palladium for a hundred dollars. Wow. All of a sudden it, then it became the most precious of precious metals. <laughs> so there is a cycle to that. Uh, will silver return in terms of its dominance? Like it was, you know, 3000 years ago, I would venture to say probably not, but <laughs> to your question, your assumption is not only accurate, but it's it's insightful in that long term. And the window I'm talking about is in decades and not in months or not in years. At some point, there will be shortages based upon the utilization, the application of silver as a semi-precious metal. And I've taken heat on calling it semi-precious, <laughs> but I'm just saying that in relationship to the price. Right. Um, but it will outstrip the ability for the mines to continue to produce it. That's that's my sense. The timeline is what I really won't venture to try to uh, put any kind of real numbers on that mm -hmm. because I, 
I'm not that good at seeing out 20 years or 10 years in the future as to what's going to change. I just know that we're on the cusp of kind of moving through that J curve. If you look at artificial intelligence, computing power, things that require uh, chips and components, and guess what? Those have a heavy need for silver. And I don't believe that technology and the way it's growing is going to require less silver in the future, quite the opposite. Well said, well said. Well, Gary, we want to appreciate you so much for coming down to Wall Street Silver. It's been an absolute pleasure. And hopefully in the next two, three months, we can have you back on. I'll wait for that call and I'll welcome it. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Talk to you soon, Gary.